is the objective. All right, so I was basically doing nothing, all right? And for some reason, I came across this post on a specific subreddit called uh, Imaginary Maps, and it's it's something. It's really something. Okay, so you might all know that I really like world building and things like that. I just kind of like those things. And yeah, up to that point, I think we can all agree that world building, alternate history, maps, uh, things like this, history and mods, whatever, are all pretty interesting things, you know? So nothing very weird about that. But then, <laughs> um, yeah. I kind of like uh, looking at other alternate histories to get a um, kind of inspiration for mine own. And for some reason, uh, I was just scrolling the server that was talking about these things. Are we actually even live, bro? What? Just mute the volume. So, yeah. Uh, this shit's wild. Alright? Let's just, let's just start by that. This stuff is fucking wild. I found it while scrolling the subreddit, I, I found it while scrolling imaginary maps, and yeah, I was just completely appalled by how big this stuff is. So, okay, there's lore, there's stuff, I'm gonna be explaining what what this all means, because it's insane, like, what it, what is this? What does this mean? Thoughts? Some images here to start with, I'm gonna go first for, wait, no, never mind. The lore. Alright, the lore, baby. So, this thing has a bunch of lore, which is um, maybe even too much, honestly. I'm just gonna start by reading the lore so you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the year is... Okay, so the year of the Black Moon. It has been 308 years since the renowned explorer Ferdinand the Magellan had been sent by the Spanish crown to attempt the first uh, circumnavigation of the globe. When the Trinidad was blown of course, the Trinidad is the ship he was sailing with, sending it on a journey that would fundamentally reshape how humanity perceived its world and what lies beyond. The fateful detour would make its crew um, would, make its, would make its crew arrive to the southernmost reaches of the world, rifting towards a desolate frozen landscape, covered by glaciers resembling a vast wall of ice and encircling the world known. On its surface, the ice wall seemed to stand in an unconquerable barrier that forbid mankind from any going uh, from going any further. Yet, as they approached, Magellan and his crew felt an explicable compulsion to keep going, even when an ominous color began to churn in the sky, when the frozen scene became uh, began to froth and boil, and the moon lost its light. Their urge to pursue the adventure only intensified. This compulsion grew into madness, as the sailors were gripped by the great and terrible versions of their mind, and were not equipped and to comprehend, and the mighty glaciers began to crumble before them. Somehow, a fraction of the crew survived for an unknown period of time, for which they were unconscious or unwilling to recall. The seas and their minds had calmed, and they found that a large portion of the glacial barrier had opened to reveal mossy coastal landscapes, bookending a vast stretch of open ocean, continuing and pass on the southern horizon. What one was a wall, now was a gate, and the sailors would return to Iberia with the sense that their unprecedented globe-spanning voyage was just the first step of a much greater journey. So for now, I'll just stop here. So. What is this? Once again, what am I talking about? What is going on? All right, let me first just uh, check up the like live and stuff, so I get everything right, and just add everyone for you know no reason. So, what really? What am I talking about? So this is the start of the lore. Where are we at? I think we are like. And Magellan uh, exploration, we're like in the 16th and 15th centuries. So we're in Spain, we're going on an expedition, going here in the Straits of Magellan, and for some reason, Magellan goes not here, but he goes, I believe, here. 
and the walls of ice, which would be Antarctica, of course, literally disappear, all right? And they are encountered, they, they encounter what appears to be, and I'll read this, all right? With Magellan nowhere to be found, Juan Sebastian Alcano led to the remaining ships back to the old world, finding unrest and upheaval everywhere they went. South of the equator, they found old war, finding unrest and upheaval everywhere. Uh, um, they found coastal villages ravaged by tsunamis and storms. The destitute people stricken with apocalyptic terror, with many perceiving the black moon as a nomen of the end of the days. As they moved north, they found less destruction, but just as much unrest. The moon had remained pitch black ever since the wall of ice had opened. A nightly reminder to the peoples of every land that something about their world had changed. The explorers kept what they witnessed as closely regarded secret, only telling the tale once they had direct audience with the king of Spain. Each man recalled what he saw while approaching the ice wall differently. Each of the visions were unique, mostly incoherent and contradictory, but there was a single common element every man could describe in pristine detail. A tall, ethereal woman whose skin was dark as cavernous abyss, but at the same time glowing with some otherworldly energy, standing atop of the glacial wall, staring them down with closed eyes. Without speaking, she called out to them, beckoning them to come closer, to join her atop of the wall, and peer over the other side to see what lays beyond. And I'm just gonna put up the actual picture of the woman, since the artist that made this uh, story actually drew her, so this is her, apparently. I assume, actually, I'm not, I am not really, like, sh sure 100%, but I, I think that's her. So you already know this stuff is weird. Like, it's, it's there's no going back, all right? It's already been pretty weird so far. Dream of the Atlas. For decades, the moon remained an empty black, black void. The long dark nights passed around to the known world with millions of restless minds consumed by speculation and a desire for answers. In every society, scholars, philosophers, and holy men will struggle to interpret the sign from the heavens and ease the worries of the masses. In Punjab, the followers of Guru Nanak, Dev were particularly emboldened by this cosmic spectacle. Whether it be a sign of change or a sign of doom, it was the duty of the Sikhs to spread the truth of the faith to the confused and divided peoples of their land, and together proceed on a new spiritual path in peace and unity with local Sunni and Hindu authorities struggling to reach a consensus in regards to Black Moon event, many of their followers turned to the Guru for answers, and their sick faith blossomed all across the Indus Basin. So apparently, for some reason, this thing, the, the, the thing that happens, the, the end of the ice wall, actually helps the Hindus, uh, you know, actually spread. So, interesting. Following the initial confusion regarding the Black Moon, the story of Magellan's fateful expedition creeped its way across the old world. Some told the story of a group of intrepid explorers called into action by a mighty emperor, who for the first time rounded the entire world, a, f a great feat of navigation that would be regarded with the promise of endless new discoveries and riches to be found beyond the great barriers of the south. Some told the story of a brutish sailor from, gold, from a godless kingdom who searched the world over unknown lands and peoples to conquer, plunder, and spread their heathen faith, their hubris carrying them to the future furthest reaches of the world, where they met God's wrath and caused divine punishment to rain down over all mankind. Some stories of an adventurer who embarked on an epic quest to see all the world's wonders, and upon reaching the end of the realm of man, opened the door to an entirely new domain, from which all sorts of powerful spirits and dangerous beasts were sure to emerge. Some told of the story of a petty king in the backwaters of what was once Rome, and who wasted his meager wealth on a pointless expedition across all manners of obscured and uncivilized lands, collecting no goods, treasures, or profit of any kind, leading their kingdom to fall into poverty and disarray, and as a final bit of poetic justice from heaven, all the lands that they discovered were washed away in a great tsunami. So what this is, is basically the different people of the world. I'm gonna assume the last one were like the Sinetic civilization, I believe, since uh, what was once was Rome, talking about Iberia. Anyways, these were like the different civilizations of the world, reacting to the stories of Magellan's men traveling on like 
the world and going from Spain all the way to the Sentinel's Gate, which, if the lore continues, we will actually learn what this actually is, because I haven't read yet what the Sentinel's Gate is. So, a so mo lot more of lore to be had here. Um, Alright, I'm gonna just put the image of uh, like the world for a while, so you guys get to see what I'm talking about, in case you don't know. And I'm gonna keep reading the lore. As the uh, okay, so beyond the gates. As the native civilizations of the Americas were being crushed under the relentless pressure of colonial invasions, the lands available for conquest and exploitation in the New World were quickly diminished, and thus several powers of the Western world would shift their focus to gain head in expeditions throughout the dominions creeping the exploration of the vast and mysterious lands that lay on the other sides of the ice walls. These four pioneer empires would establish their first colonial presence in a second ring, and along the way make discoveries just as monumental as what Magellan had stumbled upon a century prior. So it appears, it appears, that after Magellan's discovery of the end of the ice walls, so the first gate, many, explore to, uh, many explorers from the rest of the old world and the new world would try and find ways to reach what Magellan had discovered and also search up the first ring, which I am going to assume that the first ring is anything inside this red kind of reddish outline here. So everything here is the first ring. So first of all, how does the geography work? And why is the Isle of Man Missing. Why is the Isle of Man missing? Have you seen this landmass? Missing. 12,500 12, 5, 12, pounds sterling's award for accurate information in verifying the whereabouts of this majesty's beloved Isle and his manx chap. So, stuff is going weirdly. Okay, we have Bigfoot here, just walking. We have this giant kind of um, snake cryptid. Uh, it's not. A, it's a worm. It's a venomous worm cryptid uh, running across um, a Russian man, and a lot. Of, and, and apparently, this thing, the Mokele Bele, was caught like in Congo, but by, by some Portuguese man, and they thought he he was like wildlife, and it it wasn't wildlife. They had no idea what these things were. So, also Loch Ness is here. Uh, the Nessie, Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. So things are going pretty weird since Magellan actually got to the ice walls, all right? And it appears that people, instead of, you know, cutting themselves off from this exploration, are just starting to actually explore what else is inside the first ring of the ice walls. So. As far as now goes, I think it's starting to get pretty interesting, all right? Let's continue. With their already massive territories in New World... To, wait, wait, let me check... Um, okay. With their already massive territories in the New World firmly secured, granting them incomparable wealth, manpower to draw upon, Spain was more prepared than any other European nation to lead the charge in exploration to the Second Ring. Dozens of aspiring conquistadors would set sail and crusade in the spirits of the Teutonic forebears and launch a series of expeditions to the Outer Ring. So, we have two main colonizers for now that actually start doing stuff, which are Spain here and Prussia. Yeah, you got me right, Prussia. Also, you'll probably notice something. What is this map? What the hell is going on? Why does France own all this land? Why is Prussia so small? And for that, my man, and for that, we have the European lore. Because I, I believe the the guy that made this thing didn't, that, like, he did everything, all right? He thought about everything. So even we have lore for Europe. So before we continue the second ring exploration, we're going to just do a quick, quick analysis of Prussia. Since you can see them, Prussia here, but they are kind of owned by France, and France is big as hell, so we're just gonna see what Prussia says in their lore. 
the Republic of Prussia, with the strong desire among the population for nationalism induced by the French, both the, by the way of it being a French idea as a reaction to the uniquely cruel treatment by the French, but no Kaiser or all government to rally around the country being basically under military occupation, they turned to the glorification of the old Teutonic Knights and the idea of militaristic Prussia. With this as this at this point, uh, with this as the point around which the resistance rallies here, they have become rather hostile to non-Germans, especially the French, but also to the Balts and the Slavs against whom the Teutonic, King, uh, Teutonic Knights fought. This attitude has been uh, brandished against the French, Poles, Scandinavians, and other Germans, moving into lands uh, left behind from those who went to their King of Zerzura. What is the Kingdom of Zerzura? I think it's somewhere here. I think it's something here, right? Zerzura? Yeah. Zer it's very, very... So, you already can see how this is going insanely. Okay, so let's see... Let's see what the kingdom of Zerzura is, right? Because, okay, now let, let's start from like the first colonies. So we know that the Prussians went places and started creating colonies into the second ring, all right? So we know the French and the Prussians did it. So now we have to find what actual colonies they made. Also, what the hell, what is this? This is what I mean. Like, when I stumbled on this post, things like this were why I wanted to make a live about it. Because what is this? Like, you'll just open an image and boom. You have, like, shadowy figure saying things in what appears to be Antarctica, but it's actually the ice walls. Let me see if I can find, like, a German colony. Something like this. I really don't know how they would even look like a German settlement, unfortunately. New, wait, 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 uh, this sounds German enough. New Schwabenland. Okay, okay. Uh, Austrian here. All right, okay. Let me check if there's something German around here. This appears to be... What, what, what are these things? I'm so confused. And of course, we have the Atem Realm, but that's for later. Soledad, New Portsmouth, Batavia. These are all... Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have one, we have one. One Prussian colony. So, for geography-wise, this is near New Zealand. You have to remember this is a globe seen from above, like uh, what um, flat earthers think. So, there is New Zealand, and next to Antarctica, you have the Serpent's Gates, which we will actually read the lore for. This region has unique terrain covered in odd stalagmite like mounds or rock dirt. The eponyms serpents are a species of large aquatic reptiles, usually not wider than a man in girth, but tens of meters in length, though some individuals are, large, are significantly larger. These serpents swim with their bodies in bizarre contortions, constantly twisting and turning, wrapping around and through schools of fish which they feed off. Surprisingly, the fish, uh, um, the fish themselves seem to prefer to swim with the serpents, sticking close by even when the serpents are killed or injured. As a result, the fishing industry revolves around simply killing the serpents and using their bodies to lead around a school of fish. A school is like a group of fish. So, already we have like cryptids and uh, bizarre creatures living near the ice walls. But what I noticed is that here we have New Poland, which appears to be a Prussian penal colony, where troublesome Poles would, wouldn't turn similar to deported. This independent state has turned the tables on their former overlords, assimilating the Prussian minorities and establishing itself as a, as a haven for Polish refugees seeking to escape the French-dominated Europe. In a land where much harsher winters, the drowning of Marzana has become the favorite holiday of the locals, which uh, with extravagant celebrations where the giant effigies of winter goddesses are burned and tossed into the ocean to commemorate the arrival of spring. So already we have a couple of questions. What is the drowning of the Marzana? What goddess are they talking about? Why is Poland in Antarctica? And why did the Prussians not even manage to keep control of a like, small-ass colony here. But we have other colonies here, apparently. We have the Batavia port, which I can't read what this means, but whatever. A highly diverse mix of Brits, Dutch, Chinese, Javans, and Papuans, and Maori, meaning by the frosty port so that the Adaic, I don't know what the Adaic is, can make its ventures beyond Antarctica. 
known for passing time with a variety of sports played in the fields of rocky mountains spattered with snow. I'm gonna assume that the Adaic thing is like the it's like a, a trade company, like the East Indies company, something like that. So we already have a Dutch colony and a ex-Prussian colony being founded in what once was Antarctica, but now is the barrier and the serpent's gate of the ice walls. That's already pretty interesting. Let's see whatever what else we got. We guess we get the Giaccio Splendente, this thing. Post-Venetian colony. Also, I know the quality is awful, right? You don't need to mention it. Uh, Germany was in Antarctica once. Austria-Hungary uh, commenter says something like this. I believe, I believe that uh, they still are. In fact, if we go all the way south, or in this case, like uh, north, no wait, yeah, still south. If you go all this way south, you can see there is new, uh, oh my god, Neuenschwabenland, which, which is similar to New Schwabenland, New, new Swabia, which was the real German colony in uh, Antarctica in real life, they established. I mean, it's a bit controversial, so I'm not really gonna mention it too far, but the important thing is there's people colonizing from all parts of the world. And we know this because we have even uh, an Italian colony, a Venetian colony. So Ghiaccio Splendente is a Venetian colony. This surprisingly wealthy nation serves as a preferred sport, uh, oh, sorry, a preferred port for all ships passing through its serpent gates. The beauty of its capital is renowned worldwide, with immaculate towers and uh, of ice carved from coastal glaciers. Housing great casinos and markets full of luxury goods from around the gates and exotic lands that lie beyond. So we already have like the, what can I say, uh, the Singapore of these serpent gates. So we go, okay, let's say, let's save the Venetians, which I, I also noticed that don't really exist anymore as an independent state. So let's say the Italians, let's say the Italians, let's, let's get, get these guys. Uh, do a little expedition here, do a bit of expeditioning, one would say. Like this, all the way here, pass through Gibraltar, oh my god. Uh, avoid Greenland, go north, go here, pass through these islands here, or whatever. Then they, EO, maybe, maybe they even have a colony here, maybe, I don't know. They pass through New Zealand, and they go in north, but instead of getting colder, the climate just remains as in Australia, kind of. Or it's not as bad as it is in Arrive. And they established the colony of Giaccio Splendente. Which I... Oh my god, okay. Wait, let me check if I can make it a bit better. Maybe? Oh boy. Let me check if I... Yeah, apparently not. So, whatever. Giaccio Splendente, we're gonna just color you green, because why not? You are an Italian colony. So, we have a bit of a Singapore situation here. Everybody wants to get out of the Serpent's Gate, has to pass through Ghecho Spendente, because they are rich and they have casinos, apparently. Let's see who else comes here. Uh, I, I saw... Uh, okay, Nuova Yakutia, Yakutia, Russia. So this is a Russian colony in the Serpent's Gate. Seeking to thoroughly populate its first large overseas colony, the Russians sent their Yakutian minorities to settle the interior, who found themselves at home on the vast island's vast flat tundras, where they managed massive herds of reindeer, producing plentiful bounties of meat and leather that bolstered the, eco the local economy. So we really have like a bunch of colonial powers, so we have the Prussians that then had their colony rebel and turned into Poland, New Poland, we have the Batavians or Dutch, we have a colony here, we have English colonies, which are private colonies established by New England. Uh, we have Spanish colonies, uh, so Republic of Soledad, I'm just gonna quickly mention it. The Republic of Soledad, which is apparently on the, like a, a vast amount of uh, the shores here, in these areas of Antarctica. Well, the Solidarians, uh, sorry, well, the Solidarians resent the Spanish crown for their abandonment, and the Lejanos desperately seek to reunify with their motherland. Both nations have ended as of economic vassals of the nearby Venetians, so the Giaccio Splendente colony, whose trade and investments is the only thing keeping the two poor nations from total collapse. And finally, we even have a UK colony here. I can't read the name, unfortunately. 
I'm just gonna call it Antarctica because why not? Governed as a part of Australia, so you can see here that it's connected to Australia more than it is to our world's Antarctica. So, governed as a part of Australia and settled originally by especially bad criminals, the actual mass murderers of the sort, and the less horrible ones when Australia began using it as a Brits originally used Australia. This territory matches the Yi colony in terms of alcohol consumption, uh, Yatros Splendente in terms of gambling, and outpaces all their neighbors when it comes to shady dealings performed out in the wilderness. So, once again, stuff gets weird. And we're not even yet done because we have a Japanese colony here, which appears to be named Minzmi, Minzmigichi, I think. Outside of the U, uh, the few Yamato-dominated port cities, the Ainu people have uh, hailing from northern Japan make up the majority of the population. Initially deported here against their will, the Ainu would come to appreciate the freedom to continue their traditional way of life in isolation, leading all but the most stubborn tribes to relocate to this new frontier. With a healthy supply of grey bearers introduced from Thule, they have learned to tame the beasts more effectively than they ever did in their homeland, training them to be hunted partners and beasts of burden. So, very interesting stuff. So above the Russian colony and next to the Korean colony we have a Japanese colony. But it's a Japanese colony that actually comes from the Ainu population, which in a sense makes sense because we're talking about the Ainu, so, oh, no wait, this is not, a, I don't remember the, the name of this kind of island, I think it's Hokkaido, anyways. So these guys, wait, wait, let me get the right color here. So these guys went right here and passed through this land, then they passed through, I believe again, New Zealand, because it might be a good area to uh, stop by, and then they established at the Serpent's Gates, the Minzimiguchi colony. So that this is very interesting, like, you know? It's, 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 it's very interesting stuff. And we're not done yet. Instead, we're just beginning, actually. I guess. Alright, so what else, what else? We have a whole sort of area here, which is a completely different continent from anything we have in the real world, alright? So this is the first continent I will talk about in the area called Xenonesia, or Xenonesia, depending on how you pronounce it. So Xenonesia has lore too, so we will immediately read it, but I actually would like to get myself the page for this since it's easier. Yeah, this is Xenonesia. So the Circle of Invasion. This vast region of the ocean plays host to several archipelagos, are remarkable in size but notable for the unusually warlike nature of their wildlife. In every sphere of society, Xenonesian animals will rush in an attempt to seize whatever they covet with ferocity, be it resources, mates, or territory. There is little hesitation or caution, uh, and much energy. This draws a strange parallel with the lives of the Xen Xenonesian's sapient inhabitants, so already we are seeing something different from normally. We know that these people, the, 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 thing, the inhabitants of Xenonesia, have like humans in them so these guys are humans all right or they should be at least all right which is weird considering you know we're outside of earth yet we have humans so let's see how they actually got there if it's explained first came from the from the lapita oh my god <laughs> this thing is so funny if you know what lapita is this this stuff is so funny it's so good it's so good arriving by sail around 1200 bc Though they spread rapidly without obstacles, what came next was not prosperity but brutality. Covering each other's wealth, island kings wage war on one another relentlessly. Internal rivalries married every society not at war, to such an extent that no head was safe, neither either from the noose or from the axe. Tribesmen turned on tribesmen, family upon family, sibling upon sibling. When a strange- oh my god. This just gets better. Every time I read it, there's something weird uh, being added to it. When a strange extraterrestrial being known only as this Fath arrived, it was all but one particular kingdom could do to beg him to put an end to this all beheading madness. And without hesitation, hesitating, he did so. I, I see where this is going. Oh my god. Namely, by removing heads. What Thoth created was the Blemie, 
a bizarre race with the facial features of their torsos, no head, a bone plate to protect their most vital organs and freakish unnatural strength. This be resonated would protect them not from only decapitation, but from any further violence, as even unharmed confrontation was liable to the end in the mutual destruction. Of course, he soon came to the senses and fled the archipelago in disgust, leaving the kingdom to come to terms with their horrendous disfigurement. They were surprisingly happy with Svath's handwork, no longer, no longer needing to worry about violence among themselves, but the rest of normal headmen remained locked in vicious war, and the Soon, the Blemius launched a campaign of systematic genocide, oh my god, that erased every last human with a good head on their shoulders. Within decades, all of Xenonisia's headed population had left to Aten, or Dishposu, which I know what Aten is, I don't know what Dishposu is. And with that, Xenonisia was finally at peace again. The United Government they forged a great circle survived well until quite recently. It was simple and tranquil existence where a single benevolent big blem ruled. <laughs> a big blem ruled over the many cities and social circus of the island. W only occasionally raids from goblin pirates. <laughs> what the f the goblin pirates? <laughs> this is so unreal. Okay, the goblin pirates and Benjul Dishposen and Actemic pirates disturbed their peace until the first worlders arrived. Damn, this goes hard. Alright, so let's see if we can start from somewhere. Let's go back to our lovable map. So, let's go back to the Japanese since they, they seemingly are doing well. They established this Minzimiguchi colony. Minzimiguchi colony here. Alright, so they are doing something and they deported all the Ainos here. So what are they going to do next? Of course, since the trade routes go right here, and I'll start a colony here and here. So we already know where to start. Let's see what they did. Let's see what these colonies look like. So, first colony is Hinshifima, I think. In Sifima, the site of Japan's calamitous arrival in Xenonesia that wiped out or expelled all the Blemia from this archipelago, as well as most of the native bird species, courtesy of the vicious Shiba Inu. Oh my god. <laughs> this is so good. So apparently the Blemias, which I will actually show a picture of since in case you didn't understand what they said before, these are what these guys look like. It's like from the Roman beliefs that in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where we're actually not even some in like in Sudan, there were people without heads. The Romans, ancient Romans, actually believed this, or at least they thought they did. And in this world building history, the Blemia people are real <laughs> and they live beyond the ice walls, which is so funny. Anyways, so the Japanese got to the islands and established the colony of Inshifima, or Inshif yeah, Inshifima, and immediately genocided the Blemia or expel them, and then the Shiba Inus, which are the dogs, uh, Doge dog, you know, that, that guy, like, killed the local bird population, which I, I'm gonna assume it was like something like Dodos or something like that, since we're on an extinct thing thing, you know? It is the Empire's first and most developed settler colony, recreating their homeland in what is essentially a second Japan on the seas of the New World. Already getting interesting, let's see the second colony, which appears to be called Dofi Roa, I think. Dofi, Dofi Roa? Yeah, Dofi Roa. Yeah. No, maybe Dofi Rosa. I think it's Dofi Rosa. Okay, so this thing is called Hinshifima and this thing... Oh my god, what is this? Anyways, Dofi Rosa. The Dofi Rosa and Blemia were prepared for invasion after the fall of, Hiro of, of Oshifima. In Shifima, whatever, and put in a formidable fight on their many shores, leaving Japan with only a pyrrhic victory, as the headless humanoids continued to maintain fierce guerrillas into the interior, and utilizing any of and all tactics to sabotage the Japanese at any turn. Over years of colonial devastation and bloody resistance, most of the Exalta, the Blemius' favorite sex... What? I, so the Exalta are Blemia women, I think? have either fled or perished, with most of the remaining population being the hardier Bruta Blemie. Alright. Because of the state of the affairs, their disparate lust for revenge, the, the remaining Blemie wars have resorted to forbidden practices, 
mating with each other to produce a third variety, the barbaric plemie. <laughs> Which the description is, it should have never come to this. These offsprings are aggressive and simple-minded beings with short lifespans, but possess overwhelming physical strength and durability, exactly what was needed to become the monsters of Japanese nightmares, frequently ravaging settlements and making it impossible for much of their civility to be anything but a military colony. So, to recap, what do we have here? We have the Hoshin Fima colony. Wait, we actually have it like written better here, Hoshi Fima colony here, which is a calm colony, it's a successful colony with only Japanese people living here. So I'm just gonna put a little, you know, like, kind of border here, just to remember ourselves what this is. Here, we have the good colony, I would say, or at least a successful one. While here, wait, while here, we have Dofi Rosa, which is a... It's a fucking mess, alright? And with these barbarian blemies literally going around and killing people. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this? It's so funny. Okay, let, let's go Let's go to the next thing. Alright, alright. Um, the Circle of the Tsar. What? What? Okay, so the Russian. Okay, we knew the Russians were doing stuff like this, so there's not really anything new, honestly. So the Russians came from the colony of Novo Yakutia, where they deported. They re actually, they didn't just deport them. I think they just went there. Uh, yeah, they sent the minority of the Yakutians from the Yakutia Peninsula there. So these guys went north too, because of course they did. And guess where they went? To the circle of the Tsar. Yeah. That's how you call a colony, am I right? Anyways, let's read the Circle of the Tsar. The Circle of the Tsar. Still trying to figure out how they had to be a major trade port, a good mix of green Ukrainians, Yakuts, and Hawaiians. Hawaiians? What? Wait, is Hawaii owned by Russia? Let me check, alright? Because you had me interested at this point. Is it here? Wait. No, Hawaii is owned by nobody. Uh, maybe Britain? I don't know. Red? I I'm not sure. So... These guys went from there to there. Did they establish other colonies? Yeah, they actually did. So, oh my god, a lot of them. Look at this. So the Russians went here and then established this other colony in the second ring. It's Russian Neferbasta. Neferbasta, okay. So let's see what Russian Neferbasta is all about. The same system of assimilation applied to Siberian steppe peoples who works here. Stay in one place, serve in the army, face untold horrors if you're right to blame with anything other than the Cyrillic alphabet, and you're fine. Okay, so the Russians managed to uh, not assimilate, of course, because, you know, you have no head. How can you uh, be assimilated? But they managed to incorporate the Blemius, so the headless people, into the local population, which is, I mean, it's, it's definitely something, you know. But you have to write in Cyrillic, which is very Russian. All right, so let's get to the next Russian colony here. We have Rai Franza Yosef. This colony was established rather early on and by accident, as a lost Russian trade fleet were forced to settle here and adopt local Blemius customs to survive. The Blemia too would come to adopt many human customs, having been hooked on the luxurious, luxuries gifted to them from the strangers and merchants. Uh, wishing to replicate these modern wonders for themselves, leading to the birth of the thriving and unique society that was as well established by the time that they came back from. So basically, the stranded Russians came to these islands, so to Ray Franza Yosef, and they managed to, like, I guess, kind of integrate with the local Blemia population, and the Blemia also took some human elements, but eventually Russia came back and annexed the islands because they had the claim of these guys being from Russia. Any other islands here? Uh, I don't think so. I think, oh, no, wait, oh, this is another continent, never mind. Okay, so we were done with Russian colonization, I think. Let's see what else we got. 
any British? Yeah, we have a British colony here. We have a couple British colonies. Let's see where Britain is in all of this. So we know from earlier that the British established a colony here in whatever this is called, I guess, just Antarctica, which is actually just literally uh, organized and governed by Australia. So these guys are the same. It's literally just part of Australia. But apparently the UK actually went north, like the rest of these places, and decided to colonize in the first ring. The second ring. Wait, is the first ring? The second ring? I don't know. And they went here and here, and they established two colonies for now. Let's see what the first one is, which actually... Oh, frick. Alright, wait. Blah, blah, blah. I messed up the, the lines. Is it good now? Is it good? Yeah, alright. Anyways, yeah. These guys colonized these two places. And they border with the... Oh, wait. I have to stop doing this error. Okay, so these guys border with the actual Japanese colony. Which I think is quite interesting. And with the Russian colony in the eastern one. So the first colony is called... New Bristol? Is that what it says? Maybe New Bristol? Okay, so New Bristol. A warm end of temperate, lush meadow, meadowway plateau that the British managed to snatch from the Japanese only to use for its gardens and host racing. Classic British people. Most of the native blemies have been displaced, of course, through the misleading treat uh, treaties, living in small reservation, of course, very British, that too, or well graciously offered free of cost relocations to Shkidora. What is Kidora to escape the Japanese onslaught? What is Kidora again? I don't know. Wait, was Kidora this thing? Nope. Okay, so what's the uh, what's the other colony? Oh my god, I have no idea what this says. I think this actually might be Kidora. So the okay, so recapping, the British established this colony. And did exactly what the Japanese did, basically, but maybe a bit better. So the Japanese genocided the local Blemia population, while the English went here and kind of colonized it, and did the same strategy they did in America, so they gave reservations to the local populations, or they deported them to uh, a colony they call Shkidora, which is, thing I think, here is Shkidora. I'm just going to rename this since nobody's doing this. Let's call this Shkidora. Oh god, okay, never mind. Let me get the bit bigger here. Okay, so there's Kedora. Okay, I'm interested in seeing what this is. Because we know this is not a color a color that has been used yet. So this is the great circle. The long-term hurt of the Blemia civilization, and the only part still left entirely independent. It is the home of Big Blem. I would, I, I can't but laugh when I see Big Blem, the most powerful and respected of the Blemia leaders, as well as the most developed and most populated land in Xenonesia, especially so after receiving hundreds of thousands of desperate refugees eager to follow the command of Big Blem and dedicate their efforts into the preservation of their homeland and the survival of their Blemia people. The reminder of the Great Circle would, provide, would prove strong and prosperous enough to make diplomacy and trade more cost-effective than conquest for their headmen stalking their seats. So what this means is basically that these guys, the Blamium, so the headless men, managed to actually create themselves a little, I mean, it's, it's, it's a relatively little state in Xenonesia, which is actually their strongest one, which didn't get colonized. So good on them, honestly. Good job, Great Circle, on actually managing to not get killed and stuff. So yeah. We also have a Portuguese colony. We're gonna skip the very minor colonies, alright? So the Circle of the Cathedral sounds interesting. Christian Blemia maybe interesting, but you know it's a bit it's a bit oh really? oh my god, the circle. Oh wait, I wanted to skip this, but we I I I I, I read Prophet and, and I said no way. You're, st you're telling me that the Arabs colonized the headless people, and apparently, yep, they did. So let's see what the Circle of the Prophet is. Which is, uh, in case you didn't realize, Circle of the Prophet is this little thing here. I'm gonna circle it, just so we know we're actually talking about this thing. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's see what the Circle of the Prophet is about. The site of the first colony in Zinonesia that was originally founded by Muslim merchants, mostly hailing from the, Ea, from the Ake Sultanate, to operate as a hub of trade and Islamic proselytization. As the Dutch conquered the native regime, regimes of Indonesia, this colony would continue to operate as an independent entity, styling itself as the Mecca of Zinonesia, a center of Islamic learning. While the Prophet's success in converting Bohemia communities beyond their shores has been negligible, the enthusiasm shared by the Bohemia on the island itself is quite high, and the numbers only continue to rise as refugees from across Zinonesia flock here to start new lives as part of the blossoming Muslim community. Wow, okay, so the Aqsa Sultanate, or Aqsa Sultanate, I'm not sure which one is the right pronunciation, which is here, uh, here-ish, yeah, here. The Aqsa Sultanate, which eventually got conquered apparently by the Dutch, founded a colony, not in Asia, not in Oceania, not even in Antarctica, no, they went as far as Zinonesia in the second ring to, to create a colony to proselytize, which in case you don't know what means, means convert the local headless man population. All right, very interesting. Next. Oh my god, Zerzura. We got a Zerzura colony here. I'm gonna, okay, so all, all, refer all references to a thing called Zerzura will be ignored because that's for another video, another live, because that, that stuff is insane and I don't even know how to yeah, I don't even know how to approach this without actually talking about Zerzura itself. So this will be... Oh my god, Prussians. Any, oh my god. Probably between the Prussians and the Blam, yeah. Oh my god. Alright, so... We got... Okay, so these are the colonies we already did, right? Yep. Oh, we got a Korean colony. Interesting. I'm gonna, gonna circle this, I guess. We got a Korean colony which styles itself after New Yue, I think was the name. New Yue. Yi colony. So, Korea already has a colony here. They had a colony in uh, Antarctica. And they managed to actually colonize, apparently, all the way up here. In Nefer Basta. Very interesting. Let's see what this is about. Uh, Nefer Basta, which is just part of Neferbasta, because we also have Co uh, Russian Neferbasta. The Korean script being so easy to learn, Korean food being appealing to Blamia, and the friendliness of Korean drinking culture meant that assimilation didn't need to be forced in most places, but was definitely the goal. Okay, so basically the Koreans just went here and uh, colonized these islands. Uh, Alright, so the Blamia didn't get enslaved or... Or bad stuff happens. Oh, we have another colony. Interesting, isn't it? So we're at even northern. And we have the colony of Jobo Ali. Jobo Ali, large tracts of farmland manned by Bamiya and Korean ruled by a rotating hand section of iron fisted, hand hearted but ultimately practical governor. Alright, so kind of more colonial, I guess. We also have apparently a Dutch colony here and a Vietnamese colony. Damn, alright. And here we have a colony from Siam, or Thailandia, Thailandia, Thailand, whatever. Okay, all these are interesting, but I think we don't want to go extremely... Uh, hmm. I'm gonna talk about the circle of the sea form. This sounds pretty interesting to me, alright? So let's talk about this thing. Technically independent, but really a collection of Blemia who threw away their dignity to green freight greens and serve rich tourists all day, <laughs> thus avoiding several far worse fates. Okay, that's horrible, right? I don't want to. I didn't know this was so horrible. Let's go to the next one. Wang. Oh my God, these these are horrible to name because the the quality is so bad. It's already difficult to see the names. And you get this. Okay, so Wang Kofer, Korfern, Wam Wam Korfern, or something like this. Wang. Corfin. Lemmis are large, strong, resilient people, capable of laboring intensely for long hours. For some, there is only one obvious conclusion. This hoarded state set up and operated mostly by Vietnamese, but with European, Korean and especially Japanese interests behind its exist for the capture and trade of Blamia slaves, either in marauding concursions of other islands or the local population. So, yeah, this is probably the worst one. You gotta, gotta X this one out. This is the 
worst state we have read yet. Actually, I mean, I guess the genocide one was bad, but this one is pretty bad, you know? It's a pretty horrible state of affairs. Wait, which is why? Which is which? Oh, this is it this one, or is it this one? No, I'm gonna think it's it's this one. Circle of the sea worm. Yeah. Bad, bad states. Anyways, we have a Burmese colony. Interesting, interesting. Large islands have been have a respectable trading post and a tropical crop industry, while smaller islands are home to local smaller islands. Uh, sorry, to local world of pirates fighting each other over the turf. Both, however, are beholden above all through trade and blaming slaves. So this one is like this one. So they both suck. Okay, so we have blaming slave colonies in the north. Kind of sad. I expected the blamia to be better or surviving since, you know, you have heads, us, chests. So, should be better of surviving. This, this is what you guys look like. Come on, you're bigger than people. You can do it. So, you're gonna, you're just gonna ignore Zerzura here. And we already talked about the Rai Francia colony. And we have a couple more colonies here. So, we will talk about these. And we have another British colony here. Alright, so the British really did not waste time with this right so they really went all the way up to the north oh wait what, what is this why did the let me just check cancel this out so we got here we got all the way to the Shkidora. then we go north or i mean east and then we pass through these guys and then we get to the north colony here or northeast colony a pair of prison colonies, of course. The Britain, what would Britain do without prison colonies? One male, one female. Why are one male? Well, okay, okay, whatever. Dedicated to those criminals that the British government wanted to remove from the public eye, but had no particular desire to punish. The female island is inhabited mainly by suffragette types, and the male island was won by discredited politicians, the subject of sandal, scandals, and alike. Hey, that's pretty interesting. So it's uh, minor crime islands, but I mean. You can't tell me that this is little punishment, bro. You literally brought them, like, a world of distance away from you. And this is just a second circle. Now, okay. We have a Portuguese colony. Slaves who kick up enough of a fuss to get sent here under the impression it's a sort of retirement place, but the Portuguese are hoping that, uh, to get someone else to tame it for them. Wow, all right, so another slave colony, but this time it's uh, Portuguese. Oh, we have a Venetian colony. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I can't read the name. I'm just going to call it Little Venetia, I guess. This post-Venetian nation is a lucrative source of ruthless, competent, and political non-aligned privateers that can be bought in all by all manners of powers in their region. So it's like a pirate colony, but it's actually of people and not of the Blemia. We have a Sarawakian colony. That's cool, all right. Uh, and we have the Caleco Kingdoms. Okay, I want to read this one. The descendant of stranded Spaniards. Oh, this is cool. With a native Monsono Son people who were forced to fend for themselves and build new societies on these torturous terrain. Currently divided into an array of rival kingdoms based on former sport, Spanish port towns, slowly expanding their domains to the surrounding tribal villages in competition with each other and rising native kingdoms of the south. Okay, so what this is, I, I believe that the Monsonomo were the only uh, original inhabitants of these places that did maintain their human forms, so we're not Blemia, but these are still people, so with heads, and that's why they intermingled with the Spanish arrivers, which apparently colonized here, I mean, it's a weird place to colonize, but sure, why not? Let's see what this is. The Mino Heian Kingdom. Successor of the natal tribal federation collapsed under the Spanish invasion and disease, rebounding to invade the colonial settlements, driving up dissimulating the foreign people and adopting the technology. Also, we got a little art here. We have a Monsuno, Monsuno son woman, a Kaleko woman. Remember, the Kaleko ones are the mixed, uh, mixed ethnicity ones between Monsonomo and Spanish. And we have the Dishposu, the phantom gorilla. Where is it, though? Is it supposed to be phantom in the sense that it's literally nowhere, or is it like the third ring? Anyway, at every turn that can be found what can be described as hazards, fortifications, and booby traps hidden throughout the wilderness. These islands would appear specifically designed to repel intruders, I feel as if they were 
uh, being fiercely defended by native warriors. But the Navy people are not responsible for the deadly perils. Instead, they are... Um... Okay, Starlight is playing Age of History, whatever. But the Navy people are not responsible for the deadly perils. Instead, they are naturally occurring features. Plain plants and animals whose so attributes have behaviors make traversing these islands by our, a harrowing adventure. Uh, the native peoples are known as Monsonomos, humans who formerly inhabited Xenonesia before the Blemi invaded and forced them to make new homes in hostile land. So already we know that this is a, there's a big difference between these two places, because we know the Xenonesia area here is basically all Blemi, or in this case, in some islands, genocided and then on, only populated by modern humans. And then here we have Blemi populations, which can be slaves, which can be like states for themselves, or stuff like this. While the Shposu, which is different from Xenonesia, is so difficult to traverse because of the plants, the animals, and the waters, that people, like the original inhabitants of Xenonesia, managed to survive here, and when the, uh, um, the colonization of the Outer Ring started, the Spaniards intermingled with the local populations of these islands here, uh, Monsonosan people, and various European powers created colonies, so we even have a uh, small here uh, Dutch colony which we'll be mentioning uh, it's called uh, oh wait okay New Westmore no matter how hostile the environment nothing could stop the Adaic which we have um, came to the conclusion that it's uh, like the West Indies company I don't, I'm not sure what A-D-E-I-C but it's Indies and company these are the last words when they heard that there would be four oh my god there were a few four cash crops to be found here Three of them unique, sandalwood, candle nuts, candle nuts, wine nuts, nuts, and gum nuts. Anyways, yeah. So, interesting stuff. Uh, this life has gone on for a while. I think I'm gonna stop this here. We explored a lot of the world. We, uh, we already established the bases and we established the first gates, the northern gate here. The serpent's gate. We uh, have learned about Xenonesia, the Bohemias, and the Shposu. And I think the next part I'm gonna explain something like, um, I guess I could explain Aten, yeah, the new continent, the biggest of the new continents, and maybe explore the Tiger's Gates. Either way, this was a long life, it was all very interesting, honestly. This 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 guy that made this, which I can't even remember the name of for right now, did a lot of work into this world building project. Insane stuff has happened. And insane stuff will keep happening as we read on the story of the land beyond the ice wall. Thank you for being here and we'll see each other in the next video 